Hi, my name is Ted Ryan Yerson, clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Washington, medical director of the Homicide Support Project at the Virginia Mason Medical Center in uh, Seattle, Washington. Violent death accounts for 8% of annual deaths nationally, and it's the leading cause of death for those under the age of 40. Unlike natural dying from disease or old age, loved ones bereaved by violent dying, such as suicide or homicide, are left with a narrative dilemma to tell two contradictory stories, the retelling of their loved one's life that's precious, and the retelling of the external drama of their loved one's violent dying that's horrifying. For some, the retelling of their dying may eclipse the retelling of their living. This program demonstrates how to shift the psychological focus from the drama and the spectacle of violent dying or loved ones stuck in their bereavement and to shift the caregiver's attention to the longer term psychological and spiritual needs of loved ones months and years after the violent death. Our purpose is to provide clinicians, social workers, clergy and caregivers engaged in long term support with families after a violent death helpful strategies to diminish the emotional distress of violent dying bereavement. A panel of experts considers two case studies from videotaped interviews with patients I treated after the violent deaths of members of their families. Mary Walker, a 67-year-old retired special education teacher, had four children, three of whom died violently. She first consulted with me 23 years before this interview, shortly after the first death the homicide of her eldest son, which led to the disintegration of the family. Ms. Walker had no history of emotional difficulties prior to the deaths of her children. Laura Yarborough, a 56-year-old retired nurse and her husband Tom, first consulted with me 14 years before this interview when their 17-year-old daughter was murdered, a murder that remains unsolved. Like Ms. Walker, the Yarburghs had no previous history of emotional difficulties. But unlike Ms. Walker's family, the Yarburghs were able to summon a great deal of support for one another. The panel discussion is divided into three sections, corresponding with three common psychological responses to a violent death. The responses roughly follow a predictable order and occur in variable combinations. Phase one, intense separation and trauma distress. The immediate challenge following a violent death is overwhelming distress related to both the reality of death or separation distress, as well as the reality of violent dying, trauma distress. Avoidance alternates with waves of intense distress in this early phase of accommodation but a vulnerable minority of loved ones remains highly avoidant and distressed. And mothers and children of the deceased are particularly vulnerable to prolonged and intense distress. Phase two, reframing dying and nurturing imagery. The next challenge involves revising and synthesizing the traumatic memories of the killing with the nurturing memories of the deceased. Imagery related to the killing, reenactment, remorse, retaliation, retribution, and dread of recurrence alternates with imagery related to the nurturing relationship, longing, searching, rescuing, reunion. A vulnerable minority of loved ones remains possessed by intense dying and or nurturing imagery. Phase three, meaningful re-engagement. A later challenge is in establishing a meaningful reconnection with the flow of life beyond the tragedy of violent death by a hopeful recommitment with valued activities and relationships. <laughs>